After the Soviet space program, successful trip to the outer atmosphere with dogs Belka and Strelka, well, it was followed by an enormous catastrophe. A catastrophe at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Kazakh SSR, one that was so severe that it was long suppressed and wasn't uncovered until 1989. We'll talk about the sequence of events that resulted in the demise of the Soviet Commander of Strategic Rocket Forces, Deputy Minister for Defence, and along with hundreds of military and civilian workers. Today, we'll discover the Nadalin disaster. The Soviet Union within the 1960s had been pushing to both increase their nuclear arsenal to rival that of the West, but to make advancements within space travel and aeronautics. A vital location for these projects would have been the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Kazakhstan region of the USSR, which is today, of course, modern Kazakhstan. The USSR required a rocket with rapid fueling option that could be ready in minutes as opposed to hours, which is what the project would result in with the explosion of the R-16 intercontinental ballistic missile on its launch pad. Since this combination allowed the rocket to be ready for launch in 20 to 30 minutes, hypergolic unsymmetrical dimethylhazadrine, or UDMH, C2H8N2, and dinitrogen tetroxide, N204, appeared to be the answer to the problem. Additionally, the rocket's fuel may last for roughly, well, a month. However, UDMH has a huge disadvantage in that it is very toxic, very corrosive, and when burned, it releases a poisonous gas. In commemoration of the Great October Revolution, Director Yangle, the director of the launch pad, a uh, new R-16 rocket, planned to conduct its first test flight in October of 1960. To fulfill the October launch deadline course, participants strained under the weight of double shifts. One of the Army's Eastern Artillery Regiments was moved in to handle this and fill the holes within the workers' organisation, but these... These individuals didn't have the capabilities to deal with such problems. They didn't understand the sheer task that they were being put into. Many of them didn't even, weren't even told what they were going to be doing, and they sort of just went along with it. Now, Lieutenant Colonel Alexin recounts his first experience at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Where are we? Everywhere you look, nothing but desert. We couldn't see a city. Only thing we saw from the distance was a metal carcass of some metal constructions, and that was it. On the other hand, we were very excited. There was some sensation of anticipation for seeing and meeting something new. We were even jealous of our comrades who saw and met for the first time, and who were there before us. Marshal Nadellin kept a close eye and oversaw the preparations. Nadellin, one of the brightest and most accomplished officers in the artillery sector, a seasoned combat general, the first rocket marshal, and the Baikonur insider was an expert and experienced rocketeer who knew every nut and bolt of the launch pad, every technical aspect of the construction of the launch site. Early on October 23rd, while fueling the rocket, it was reported to Marshal Nadellin that they have a problem, that there was a leakage of fuel tanks, 140 drops per minute. Nadellin consulted Yangle and other specialists and made the decision on the spot to continue fuel fueling operation and proceed with the launch schedule immediately. On the 23rd, as mentioned, the rocket was installed on launch pan 41, and it began to leak fuel whilst it was being prepared for the test launch, as noted by Marshal Nadellin. The rocket was fueled with a hypergolic pair of UDMH as fuel, and saturated solution of N204 in nitric acid as the oxidizer nicknamed Devil's Venom, which was used because of the high boiling temperatures and storability of the fuel, and the oxidizer despite being extremely corrosive and toxic. The safety requirements of the launch procedures took these risks into account. Uh, the Dellum's insistence on conducting the test launch before the Bolshevik Revolution anniversary on November 7th, 1960 did lead to, well, launch preparations and pre-launch testing started to overlap. When you're already pulled into this kind of business, when you work for this problem for 10 to 12 hours a day, you see the light at the end of the tunnel. You don't want to delay your work until tomorrow. You want to finish it now, you know? I count Vladimir Kukushkin, who was working at the launch site. Meanwhile, new tests were revealing new problems in the control system. The experienced test engineers anticipated these problems would happen and expected they would all eventually be eliminated and fixed prior to a successful launch, but no one had experience fixing these kind of problems on a rocket fully loaded with toxic fuel. 
It was reported that the launch pad before its launch was crowded with officers, soldiers, doctors and engineers and it is also confirmed that the Delin was present on the launch pad and when an officer commented that he should lead the area for his safety he said, what is there to be afraid of? Am I not an officer? Accounts Captain Ivan Murashko while the marshal was sitting on the folding chair, smiling and looking at me, I approached his aide-de-camp and told him, What are you doing? Look how complicated the situation is here. It's scary. But he looked at me and replied, Well, what can I tell him? What can I do? He is the marshal. On October 24, 1960, at the Cosmodrome Baikonur, the R-16 stood fully fueled on the launch table in preparation for lift-off at 7 o'clock. The missiles never became airborne, as 30 minutes before the launch pad, the second stage roared into life, but then seconds later, the fuel in the first stage exploded into flames. Several of the engineers and technicians on the launch platform implementing repairs and preparations when the second stage ignited were most likely killed immediately. Many who survived the initial explosion ran to escape the inferno, some by jumping or falling off the platform to the launch table, a concrete surface surrounded by a barbed wire fence. Six metres below the R-16, those who had survived the plunge made it to the fence, tore their bodies trying to get past the barbs. Others ran for safety, their clothes and hair burning, and succumbed to the toxic fumes and flames in minutes. Nobody was able to survive. The final fighting station was one of the first to sustain damage from the explosion and it was situated just 50 metres from the launch table. In accordance with regulations in effect at the time, in addition, despite the fact that many of these people were critically hurt and required emergency care, medics were not permitted to be pre-stationed at the launch site, again in accordance with regulations in effect as of late 1960. <laughs> Unknown is the precise number of deaths caused by the explosion, while the Guardian claimed it in 1965 using information from spy Oleg Penkovsky, who had supplied intelligence to the West, that as many as 300 people had perished in the accident. The earlier Western reporting of the tragedy via the Italian Continentale News Agency in December 1960 stated that 100 people had died. When the Soviet Union initially recognised the tragedy in 1989 article, it simply said that a significant number of people had perished. Perished. On October 28, 1960, a major Russian newspaper published an announcement from the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR. The brief announcement stated, The Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR and the Council of Ministers of the USSR, with the deepest regret, informs that on October 24, 1960, Marshal Mitrofan Nadelin, Deputy Minister of Defense of the USSR, came to a tragic end as a result of an aviation catastrophe. No further details were given about Nadelin's death and not to mention, well, those who died with the Marshal. It was not until 1989 that the world learned of the true circumstances of Marshal Nadelin's death and the total scale of the tragedy. The first successful launch of the R-16 was conducted on February 2nd, 1961, 100 days after the death of Nadelin, and the missile impacted only 520 kilometers from the launch site. In 1994, all of the investigation committee documents related to the accident were declassified, and in 1999, 39 years later, after the disaster, the presidential decree of the Russian Federation awarded 99 launch participants the Order of Courage, and 63 of them posthumous. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. I thought I'd make this one, you know, just a little bit more documentary style. Uh, I, I've not done a lot of videos recently and I want to get back into them. I've just been really declining with my mental health, if I'm being honest with you guys. I'm not doing particularly well at the moment, but we'll get through it and we'll continue YouTube. So I'll see you guys in the next video. I don't know what it'll be, but it'll be good. I'll see you guys.